I think the first thing I noticed is the change of their voice. So they're the poor things that they're trying to vocalize and um, they just have this really distinctive um, voice change mm. where they're trying to make that extremely loud lorikeet screech that you hear when they're healthy, but they can't. So that was pretty confronting to, to hear that because they sound quite distressed. Some of them completely lose their voice or even to a whisper. Lorikeet paralysis syndrome is, is characterized by what we call a flaccid paralysis or uh, a weakness, which is pretty much an, an ascending paralysis that includes the legs and the wings and um, in particular a change of voice an inability to use their tongue, inability to swallow, and inability to blink. David Phelan is a professor of veterinary science at the University of Sydney. He's describing a mysterious condition that is paralyzing lorikeets and leaving them unable to fly. It's called lorikeet paralysis syndrome. I would say, imagine that you're walking down the street and you ate something, then all of a sudden things start to get tingly and or you're walking through the woods and you fall over and you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know if somebody's going to find you. You don't know if you're going to get better. You don't know if you're going to die. And you imagine the anxiety and the fear that you would be going through. And each one of these rainbow lorikeets is experiencing that same thing. They're going through a really terrible time. And then they get picked up by somebody, and their only knowledge of, of people is that they might be predators that are going to eat them or kill them or, or whatever. There have been reports of this sudden paralysis affecting lorikeets as early as the 1970s. No one knew what could be causing it. But like any mystery, there were some clues. For one, it's a seasonal condition occurring between October and June only in a single region of southeastern Queensland and northern New South Wales, and only affecting lorikeets. Claude Lacasse, a wildlife veterinarian at the RSPCA Queensland, had been running tests but wasn't able to uncover the culprit behind the paralysis. Then, Claude teamed up with David alongside Dr Carrie Rose a veterinary pathologist at the Taronga Conservation Society. They began their investigation at Claude's facility in Queensland, examining the lorikeets that were being brought in with paralysis. And that starts with a complete physical examination, and then that goes to doing a workup where we collect blood and look at biochemical changes in the blood that might suggest that they had um, damage to a specific organ system, muscles, um, kidney or liver. And we also submitted tissues to the Environmental Protection Agency who, who ran a, a series of tests actually where they looked for several hundred potential uh, toxins that could be causing um, these kinds of signs. After all this testing, they still hadn't identified the cause. And so we basically ruled out a lot of different things. And so that left us with uh, pretty much the suspicion that this was caused by an ingestion of a toxic plant. And the other um, reason that we thought that this was caused by the ingestion of a toxic plant is that it's confined to a certain region, which is um, possibly a region that these toxic plants might grow in. So our assumption was that it was an introduced plant, a plant that probably had been introduced by humans to, to Australia that the lorikeets hadn't um, adapted to feeding on over their history. But exactly which plant is responsible remains a mystery. Until the culprit is identified, lorikeet paralysis syndrome will continue to claim victims. Bronte Potts, a Queensland-based veterinary nurse, has seen the devastating effects this condition can have on lorikeets firsthand. There's no one working in a wildlife hospital that's not there because, you know, they want to make a difference and want to want to 
save animals and and see them back out in the wild seeing you know the sheer volume that we see of lorikeets um which which for you know the busy wildlife hospital that I've had experience in is you know in the thousands each year they don't all make it and and that's really hard um and and seeing them sort of you put in everything and you see them struggle and um when they make it it feels amazing and you feel like you've made such a difference and you know you get to see them go to carers and the carers are so passionate and that you know they will let us know when they've released them and things like that um obviously not each individual but they'll release a flock they'll really release them all together and you know that that's amazing but certainly the seeing them you know struggle um and and often not make it after even after putting giving everything you've got is is really tough so it's something that yeah, I think a lot of people struggle with. The resources of wildlife carers and researchers are stretched thin, to say the least. They have little funding support at any level of government and only so much time to give to animals in trouble. To help narrow down the list of suspects, they utilised citizen science. Sure. Well, the bottom line is is that if you have graduate students or, or yourself that want to go out and find out what lorikeets are feeding on, that takes an enormous amount of, of effort to do. And it's very, very difficult to get a, a large data set by just one person going out and, and doing that. So uh, more and more uh, people are using citizen science to study um, what's happening in nature. And we thought that we could probably recruit large numbers of, of people and gather huge amounts of data uh, with volunteers that we could never get by doing it ourselves because there just wasn't time and, uh, to, and financial uh, reserves to do that. The iNaturalist app allows everyday people to identify and record observations of plant and animal life. It's hoped that the use of the app will help reveal which plant is responsible. So we um, set up this um, program through iNaturalist where people could go out and take a picture of a plant that an animal was feeding on. We have a photo of the lorikeet. We can see the um, age of the lorikeet. We can, see, we can see the location of where the photo was taken. Holly Bowden, a student at Sydney University, is one of several people involved in processing photos and data gathered through iNaturalist. Then we have the RSPCA data, which shows us where uh, lorikeets with lorikeet paralysis syndrome were found. Let's say they were also found in suburb A, B and C. We can start to see a correlation between the toxic bush, the radical bush, and the lorikeet being sick. And we can start to say maybe the toxic bush is the cause or one of the causes behind this paralysis. Wildlife conservation is a catastrophically underfunded field. So uh, citizen science platforms like iNaturalist are amazingly beneficial at gathering data. It's just an amazing resource. And um, I think it's really valuable for people to be empowered to uh, have their own impact on the community around them. The researchers have managed to rule out many suspects, but they can't solve this mystery on their own. Citizen science contributions remain the best chance of identifying the culprit plant. Once they do, they'll be able to prevent, or maybe even cure, lorikeet paralysis syndrome. And I encourage anybody that might have an interest in this to, to, to join the, the crew that's investigating it, because I think when we finally do find the answer as to what's causing this, um, that we can prevent it, help to prevent it, and we may be able to come up with advanced treatment options that will allow these birds that have it to recover more quickly. You shouldn't be able to be able to go up to a lorikeet, pick it up, and take it somewhere. Like, it's a wild bird, it should fly away. Because like I said, it's something I'm really passionate about, and I think because lorikeets aren't one of those rare things that you never see, um, people kind of are just like, oh, you know, it's just a lorikeet. But 
they forget their little individuals with their little individual personalities and you know they hang out in groups and they have their relationships and things like that um with each other so uh i was stoked to hear that there are people out there um who who want to get the word out and make a difference Thank you very much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. I also have to thank all my interviewees for this story. David Phelan, Holly Bowden, Bronte Potts and Maya Yaffe. And also a big thank you to Ryan Pemberton for helping me produce this. This originally appeared as an audio only version which I shall link down in the description. And let me know, do you have any weird biological mysteries in your part of the world? And if you liked this video, then you might also like my video about the Tasmanian tiger. Thanks again, and take care of yourself.